hello everybody. Uh, you're all very welcome here. Um, and I want to introduce somebody who in 1977 made a groundbreaking documentary called Across the Andes by Frog. Very soon after that, luckily, life started emulating art. And so, the man we're going to meet this afternoon has made seven gilt-edged documentary series. Around the World in 80 Days, Pole to Pole, Full Circle, Hemingway Adventure, Sahara, Himalaya, and New Europe. Along the way, he's collected awards from all sorts of people. BAFTA, of course, won the Lust magazine for his writing. Uh, the Queen, CBE, and would you believe he's had not one, but two trains named after him. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael Bailey. Um, we are actually going to see some of Michael's work. Um, rather than me saying, let's have, have the next clip, please, there is going to be a five-letter word beginning with S that is the code word for each of the clips. Yeah, um, but look, we can't start. We, we have to, because everybody in this room is going to be very focused on the great world events of this week. Um, first of all, can I ask, is the Western world in safer hands with nobody named Palin anywhere near the control. <laughs> well, absolutely, I always thought it was. You know, never yeah. Palin near the controls. But my namesake, and, and, and she's not my illegitimate daughter, as some have suggested. <laughs> uh, but um, I think I think one has to say that she's has to be congratulated on, on helping Obama <laughs> win so, <laughs> comprehensively. So I, I, I thank her for that. But she'll be back. You know, we Palins, we don't go away. I'm <laughs> She'll be back. How does it feel, though, to lose your franchise? Um, mm. Six months ago, if you Googled Palin, mm. hot pops, Palin travels. Palin's yeah. travels. And um, now, <laughs> yes. you're sick. Um, <laughs> how does that feel? Well, I feel bad about my family. <laughs> I feel pretty bad. No, I, just, I feel for my family. You know, it's my, my wife <laughs> has things on. Reads the paper, say, you know, um, Democrats attack Mrs. Palin. And uh, that's just a breakfast. And then my, my poor daughter sees, you know, shock, horror, Palin pregnancy. And uh, she has to deal with that at work. And so it is, it is, it's an unusual name. And, and I must say, it's taken a bit of the heat off. So don't feel, oh, that's not always me. That's to blame for these things. And I've, I've to be honest, quite enjoyed it. Well, you're back in the city where you were born a while back. Um, the city where your dreaming is repaid, according to the wall I've just read. Is it home, and has your dreaming been repaid? Um, well, it is home, because uh, I was born and brought up here, and I lived here for 20 years. And I think that the, the city you're born in, the place you're born in, is where your sort of formative ideas grow about places and what they should be like. And, uh, that's why I, I've lived in London for a very long time. I don't regard it as a city in the same way Sheffield was a city. Um, I don't regard sort of you know, brick architecture the same as sort of stone and all that, you know, like you see in Sheffield. So, um, I mean, I, I do see myself still as a Sheffielder, um, a bit of an outsider. Someone once said about <laughs> one thing that distinguished all the Python teams, they were all from small, well, not small, they're all from the provinces. And uh, it was Barry Took felt this was the reason why we did the comedy we did, slightly sort of attacking, because, uh, you know, we were, we were outsiders looking in. So, uh, no, I, I, feel, I, I feel this is very much my home. And I suppose I didn't, yeah, I mean, you do, that's what you do when you're young, you dream about things. And I used to go down to Sheffield Midland Station, my train spotter's book, and <laughs> see these trains come by and, and just see the words, you know, Glasgow, London. Um, and think one day I might go to one of those places. And I was always waving somebody else off and always felt I wanted to travel. But, uh, you, you know, I, I, I mean, my dream, I suppose, has been repaid many, many times, because not just travelling, but I also, my friend and I, we loved uh, comedy films, and we always liked the writers. We always looked at who was the writer of the film, which a lot of people don't bother with. And I think we, we thought one day, you know, we'll be script writers. In no way, <laughs> no way. Coming from Sheffield, you never become a script writer. So things have worked out quite well, and I thank Sheffield for that. I think it's given me a bit of grit to get on with the job. Of course, one of the Pythons was, I think, from the province of America as well. Um, let's get down to work. Now, I, I was going to begin with um, Around the World in 80 Days. That was until last Saturday, and I don't know how many people here saw 
the remarkable Time Watch documentary on BBC Two last Saturday night, the last day of World War One. Um, it was heartbreaking, it was brilliant, it was beautifully researched, structured and filmed, but ultimately it was a conventional documentary. Why? Well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing a conventional documentary. I think sometimes it's better to do something that's simple and follows a, a certain narrative pattern that isn't gimmicky. But the, the reason I got involved was because about a year ago, the Time Watch strand was threatened. I don't know if you remember, that it was going to just be BBC were going to get rid of Time Watch. And I like the Time Watch programmes, I like history, and I like the way they put these rather conventional but, but uh, uh, informative documentaries together. So I helped sign a letter or something like that. And we got the Time Watch strand saved. And then this a uh, producer said, um, we're doing a film about the, the last day of World War I, would you be interested? And I've always been fascinated by the First World War. And I thought the last day, what happened in the last day, how you end a war of that size and that scale, uh, was an interesting uh, topic. And, and I'm very, very glad that I, I got involved. But it was, it, it, you know, it was written for me. I was, I was a presenter, but uh, it was basically they'd done all the hard work. It was just a very good choice of subject and very... So, I, mean, I thought it was very grim, but it, you know, no laughs and things like that. Mm. It's still available on iPlayer. Um, of course, in a conventional documentary, you can uh, control the various elements, but once a team starts travelling, well, it all gets a little bit random, as we're about to see. Sushi! <laughs> <laughs> sort of um, um, aspect of that was that Naomi never wrote to me again after that. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard from her again. So uh, what did I do wrong? Did you need to go and rediscover her. Never see your heroes yet. <laughs> totally let down. We saw the crew there, not for the first time yeah, sure. on your programmes. But is there a standard <coughs> painting crew? Um, well, Pretty much so. Uh, we usually work with um, about five people as a cameraman, obviously, and Nigel Meakin, who was cameraman on Around the World in 80 Days, the first thing we did 20 years ago, was also filming with me last week in India when we did a return to Around the World in 80 Days. So Nigel is just brilliant. He's been with me all that time. We've had two or three sound men, but basically, um, you know, I do like to work with the same group of people. Uh, two directors, Roger Mills, uh, who directed me on the first day of Around the World in 80 Days, also directing now. He's 72, still with, still with a sort of saga platoon as we go around. <laughs> so it's incredibly ancient. Um, but I do like to keep the, um, um, a small crew, and to keep the people you work with is just, just very useful, because you've got a kind of rapport with those people. And it's very hard to build up with somebody else, especially with a cameraman. And Nigel and I kind of know how to keep out of each other's way now. And we don't have to have a rule. Shall I go there and then I move there? Will you take this? We, I just trust him and he trusts me. And, and it does work, work very well. You haven't mentioned wardrobe or makeup? What about them? No, no. I, <laughs> they strangely never seem to appear. I wait for them at the airport. But, uh, uh, no, we never have wardrobe, never have makeup, as you can tell. <laughs> now, she, of course, knew you from Python. Yeah. How then do you make the leap? from comedy to travel documentaries in a single bound? Um, well, it was, 19, it was 1988. Ooh, cast your mind back. Ooh, a foggy day. Um, <laughs> and I had uh, been making a number of films in the 1980s and had just finished doing um, Alan Bennett's... No, not, sorry. I'd done Alan Bennett's Private Function, done Time, time Bands with Terry Gilliam, The Missionary, and also um, uh, Fish Called Wanda. And they were great, great films to do. There was just nothing else around at that time. I thought, well, um, what shall I do? Python had sort of ended with uh, The Meaning of Life in 1982. So I was kind of in limbo, and the BBC rang me up in a rather conspiratorial way. So I thought, I want to ask you about something very special. It's a very special job. You're the only man who can do this. Very <laughs> sort of bomb stuff. And uh, anyway, Will Wyatt from BBC came round to my house, and as darkness fell, explained to me this... Uh, uh, proposition which he said he couldn't tell me about on the phone because you know people might be listening <laughs> and it was basically around the world in 80 days idea and he said you are the you just there's something about what you do the way you do it your wit your style your humor 
Um, you know, you've just got all the qualifications for this, so, so you know, you're just our man. I, I, he said, anyway, think about it, and I was so completely flattered, I ran it straight away. And it was only much, much later, when we were halfway around the journey, we were, we were in Madras, it was a particularly hot, sweaty day, and nothing was working out, and the director admitted under pressure, and after several beers, that I was the fourth person. <laughs> <laughs> so they were all being flattened, Alan, Alan Wicker and... Uh, Alan Wicker turned it down because I think they took him to a pizza restaurant for lunch. And we don't do that without giving the four course treatment. Um, Miles Kington, who I, I knew and who died uh, very, very sadly and very prematurely recently, uh, he was the second one. And um, uh, Noel Edmonds was the third. <laughs> it, gets, it, gets, it gets worse and worse, really. Um, I'm sure Jonathan Ross will be muffled if he'd been alive. <laughs> okay, well. Even though you were fourth, fourth choice, um, you created your very distinctive style. Were you, were you aware of it? Was it a conscious decision to do that? Other documentaries are more polished, but yeah. yours are uh, not so engaging. I didn't really know quite how to do this one. I, I mean, uh, there wasn't a script. We just had to make it up as we go along. And uh, I didn't really realize this till the day we set off. And I suddenly thought, I've got 80 days of this. And there's no script. I've just got to you know, invent things to say. What on earth, uh, how on earth are we going to fill the time? Uh, yeah, you know, and uh, it's all going to be ad libs and all that sort of thing. And um, I must say, to start with, I was quite nervous. And I, I thought, well, maybe I should play um, a character make Phileas Fogg into sort of character. And if you see the first three episodes of 80 Days, I'm just slightly sort of you know, outside talking about me as the traveler, mm -hmm. putting on a slightly bufferish voice. And then we did the third episode, which was on the down, going from mm -hmm. Dubai to Mumbai, Bombay as it then was. And that we were eight days at sea with these 14, 15 um, Gujarati fishermen from India. Um, we had no radar, we had no radio. There was nowhere to hide, there was no cabin. We're all living on the deck sharing their food, using the sort of outside lavatory, which looked outside lavatory, hung over the side of the boat. And, uh, and, and I got quite ill on one of the days and had to do a piece to camera saying, I'm just miserable. <laughs> I don't feel very good. I want to sit in a chair. I want to go home and all these sort of things. And by the end of that, I think I'd forgotten about being an actor and acting it. And I was just being myself. <laughs> and it, it wasn't really a problem then. I just realised, well, there's nothing I can do. I can't. I can't sort of churn out polished, witty, complete sentences on everything. I'm just going to have to be the way I am. And if I cock things up, I cock things up. And, and it turned out, of course, in the end, this is what people really like. They like me being ill. They like me being completely <laughs> incomprehensible uh, when trying to buy a ticket in an Egyptian station. And, um, and so, you, you know, you kind of discovered a style. But the thing to remember is that that was just going to be a one-off. There was no question of me doing any more travel programmes. This was just something to fill in the time till the next bit of acting or the next film came along. Um, so a lot of things evolved during Around the World 80 Days, and then at the end of it I thought, oh, well, that's that. And, 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 t and it didn't go out until a year later, so you didn't have the judgement of the, the viewers or the critics and all that. And, uh, um, so. Can, can I just ask, when you, when you are speaking to the camera, who are you speaking to? Do you have, uh, do you visualise somebody? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a very good question. Um, I suppose I'm speaking to the camera. I'm speaking to Nigel, in a way, and our little team. I'm, I'm aware of them. Um, and if I'm just doing sort of off-the-cuff stuff, um, then they're like my sidekick. It's that more of a wise sort of thing, you know, you have your side view and I will say something to them. Uh, if I'm doing a sort of piece to camera which has been scripted, and we have to do that, especially at the beginning and end, um, then I suppose I'm talking to the viewers out there, whoever they may be. So I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking about millions and millions and millions of people. <laughs> vast ratings. And well, huge. To be fair, it's worth pointing out that I think the first episode of New Europe was the highest rated documentary of all of last year, 7.8 million people. Yes. Does yeah. that worry you? Well, it worried me it went down by a million the second week. But, uh, <laughs> I'm told this happens in the business. Uh, no, I mean, that's... Uh, I suppose I've realised now that what I thought of was, was something rather unfocused and making it up as we go along and extemporised is actually what people like and, and I've applied this to all the other programmes that we've done and apart from Hemingway, which is an odd one, 
um, all the rest have been done by the traditional methods. And the BBC have sometimes <coughs> tried to change us. Um, when we did Sahara, I think, in 2001, they were a little bit wa wary of uh, you know, me doing it. And Hemingway hadn't got the, the viewing figures that the others had got. And so there was a lot of talk about how do we make this you know, better for the modern audience. And Michael having a, um, a computer with him and, and interacting with the audience at home. So he's in the middle of the desert and they say, oh, go left or right, what shall I do? All this sort of stuff. I mean, I can't even a, a box of matches without dropping, <laughs> let alone work a computer. So that was out. And I just said, well, can we just, just do it the way we've always done it? And they said, all right. And, and so we've, we've always kept the same, the same style. I can't remember what your question was now. Uh, I don't Am know. I near? Am I great? Uh, I think he's very, very well. And uh, yeah, worth pointing out that, of course, much of your work is completely unrehearsable and unscriptable. Scale. <laughs> <laughs>
And this was all that his worry was about. Um, and he liked the viewfinder on his little, um, sort of, uh, his little film camera. So, yeah, we, we now, well, we did work New Europe on, on high definition. Okay, but um, film must have been so limiting, for instance, if you've only got 10 minutes for a particular film. Yes, yeah. How do you, how do you, if you're interviewing somebody, how does that Well, work? you just kind of get used to it. Uh, it. It's like the parameters of your work. You know that they'll load up, and, and if you're doing an interview, you've got 10 minutes, then you'd have to stop and say, I'm terribly sorry, you've got to load up again. All that. I think it's a good discipline myself. Uh, I don't particularly like having tapes just run on and on on. Someone says, oh, just keep, keep talking. I don't like that. I'm, I know we've got a lot to do that day. On these programmes, we work very hard. Some will have two or three interviews in a day, and you'll be travelling, and you'll be doing some, some general views and all that. So the tighter the interview can be, I think, the better. Sometimes people need you know, time to warm up. But usually, you know, 10, 15 minutes is quite enough. But with the, with the tape, I have occasionally had cases where the director just says, talk on, talk blah, blah, blah. And I just know, I, I can feel it. I'm a Yorkshireman, I can sense the waste. You don't like, you don't like waste. Um, so I, I, in some ways, could deal, could deal with that 10 minute break. But it, it's just immeasurably easier for actors for act, sort of getting about. Um, and the great thing, of course, with tape is you can see straight away, run back what you've shot. So if you're not sure whether you've got the right question interview, now you can look at it then and there, which of course you couldn't do with film. We couldn't see anything of what we shot till we got home. But it didn't stop the programmes being perfectly good. And of course the camera kept turning um, in a particularly worrying game of um, Saharan roulette. Sands. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many of you noticed Michael Finch just before that uh, explosion. Um, I must say, Michael, I don't wish to embarrass you at all, but one of the people I was speaking to before I spoke to you said you're exactly the opposite of a prima donna, the easiest person in the world to deal with. Is it possible that in that particular um, uh, clip, yeah. you're having almost had yeah. half your front face blown away, you're just on the brink of being mildly tetchy? Yes. <laughs> I was well on the brink of being tetchy. I was, I was, you know, uh, well, for a start, shooting that's incredibly hot. I mean, you can never really tell that, but it really was hot. It's sort of 110 or something. And this thing was going on and on and on. And I, uh, just occasionally, you get irritable in, in the worst possible way. You say, why didn't anyone check that gun? <laughs> you couldn't check the gun. It's a crazy old gun, you know, and with a gun We're all getting a lot of fun out of it. <laughs> so it had, you know, it was something unexpected and unpredictable, and that works very well. But when it actually happens, mm. and and it really did go, I mean, right across my brow there. And if, if they got in the eye, I think it could have really been a problem. So yes, I was a little upset. <laughs> um, I don't know who win. Uh, we've got a very good sequence out of it. Um, but I suppose just just every now and then you do sail quite close to the wind, and, and people make you do things which sometimes you, you think is a, a bit dangerous. Well, yes, and in 20 years, has institutionally views of, of risk changed? I mean, does, mm. does a BBC health and safety officer accompany you everywhere nowadays? <laughs> and do you personally feel, actually, the things we were doing in the, in the first around the world yeah. 20 days, we wouldn't dream of doing now? Yeah, um, I think things have changed. <laughs> and and uh, when we did Sahara, we had to have a, a course. Of the BBC a, a special team came down from... Uh, Manchester to tell us about security in these trouble-torn areas, and they told us things like how to get through um, uh, a barrier. You know, if if, if someone uh, at, at, a, at a road barrier, if someone got to put a sort of special bar across the road or something like that, this, if they have any trouble, you have to go back, rev up, and straight the brakes, and go up, and hit the bar up, and off you go in your car. Fantastic. What do they think? I'm going Don't to try this at home. Yes, exactly. <laughs> driving anyway. <laughs> so they put the absolute fear of God into us and um, uh, you, you know generally I've not felt threatened or very 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 rarely felt threatened anywhere in the world but now they do specify that I have to wear a helmet if riding an elephant for instance something like that. So I'm afraid it's about yours. You know, I'm an elephant with, with a helmet on. <laughs> Complete idiot. You know. <laughs> it's like having Tarzan with a safety belt. <laughs> Tarzan's coming down now, clear the area, clear the area, here it comes. You know, it's just ludicrous, so um, I'm, I'm 
sure if something happens, probably insurance wouldn't pay out. But I mean, you, you've got to go with the flow and you've got to really, in order to get a rapport with the people you're with, you've got to just be reasonably relaxed. And, and you've just got to try things out. Well, OK, let's, let's look at uh, an episode in, in Himalaya mm-hmm. where there were Maoist insurgents who basically yeah, kidnapped a, 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 a guide. Yes. What does the documentary team do in that circumstance? Is it your duty to intervene or to observe? Well, in this particular case, and we were in a, a, a fairly remote village, quite a long way from Kathmandu and quite a long way from any, any civilization. But we had gone there with this Gurkha, uh, British Gurkha officer to show, he was going to show us how they get the Gurkhas and the tests they give them to join the army. Um, so he was our guide and he was looking after us. And he was the one who was actually um, asked to go you know, not forcibly kidnapped, but asked by some local Maoists, came to the tent after you've done days filming and said, we want you, you and you, to come and explain yourselves to the local chief. So we just didn't know quite what was going on, and our director went as well. And they went off, and they were gone for about a couple of hours. And then the director came back and said, they just want to question the officer for another hour, then he'll come back. But he didn't come back, he didn't come back till the next morning. Now, interesting, what do we do? Charge off into the bush and find him. We didn't know where he was. Um, and we were strongly advised by everyone just to get out of the place as soon as possible. As soon as we got out of the village and got down on the ground, we and got within phone range. Uh, we, we rang up Kathmandu and we rang up the embassy and all that and uh, told them that the guy had been kidnapped. And it was amazing because we actually we had a name of the, the man at the embassy and we said what it was and he said, uh, his uh, I know he can't come to the phone now. We said, well, what's the problem? He's having lunch. <laughs> <laughs> they, said, they said, it's Sunday. You know, it is Sunday, you understand. He said, oh, it's Sunday, is it? Yeah, we just don't know. He said, no, it's having a Sunday lunch. You ring at the end of lunch. It's having some officials round for lunch. And we said, it's very, very important that he rings. And we couldn't actually say what had happened mm-hmm. onto this guy. But it was about an hour later. Yes, what's the problem? Well, one of the top-ranking officers has been kidnapped by the Maoists. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'll forgo the coffee and off he went. You know. Well, let's um, see a bit of a, a happier Himalayan encounter. Yes. Saint. That was particularly tricky to edit, actually, because we, um, we shot about 45 minutes. He was very, very... Um, good to us and, and, and stayed on long after the sort of 30 minutes we, we'd uh, booked, as it were. And, uh, and yet, when it comes to putting the shows together, we, we don't really do any interviews longer than about three, three and a half, four minutes. But of course, this one, you had to do it because we talked about so much. And yet, I do feel that so much of this wasn't, wasn't in the final cut. But it's the great thing now is you put them on DVD so people will actually see them and the interview in full is on, on the DVD available now. <laughs> <laughs> a few people can say I had that Dalai Lama in the back of my documentary once. <laughs> uh, but I just wonder, when, when you are making a series like uh, in there, you have what is called in the travel industry the Palin effect. Nothing to do with Sarah at all. <laughs> um, and suddenly, the day after it's gone out, um, all these um, Himalayan expedition companies report a surge in bookings. Now, are you consciously inspiring people to go there, or are you simply seeking to inform them about the situation in Tibet, or are you there just to entertain them? No, I'm just making a living, you know. I mean, uh, <laughs> it is work. But I, I, um, I do the job because I'm curious, and because I'm fascinated by foreign countries, and, and because I feel that I'm very, very lucky to have a chance to go to these countries and meet people you would not normally meet if you're on a, a regular tour. Um, and so I suppose I'm, I, I, I'm glad that my enthusiasm manages to sort of uh, uh, transfer itself to other people. But I'm also glad that, you know, I can show people what these countries are like and let the people themselves talk about those countries. And if it does make people want to go there, or, or, or even if it doesn't, but it makes them want to know and understand a little bit more about the countries, then, then yes, that is very important to me. What I don't want to leave behind is just a sort of feeling, oh, Mike Ben went somewhere, that's it. You know, it's, it is important where I go and how we, how we deal with the place. And um, I, I'd like to share my own curiosity, because I think the more 
the more you see of the world, I think the less um, frightened one is of it. I, I think, you know, we, we tend to be here at home and you read a certain amount of uh, information about the rest of the world, not a lot, but you're generally, the general feeling is um, that, that certainly what our leaders are telling us to do is that the world is a da dangerous place with lots of people who want to kill us, destroy our way of life. And it doesn't strike me like that. When I've gone around the world, I don't, I never felt that at all. I mean, you can tell there are emergencies, there are problems, there are difficulties, generally made by politicians, reinforced by armies. The people you meet most of the time are curious, hospitable, uh, understanding, warm, kind, generous, want to know about you as much as you want to know about them. So I suppose I am trying to say that's what the world is. It's not George Bush's world. It's not war on terror. That's absolutely no use to anybody at all. You've got to just go there and see these people and let them tell you what they feel and go, you know, I, I, mean, I know BBC crew is not exactly travelling with ordinary people, but we, we, we do, you know, we don't travel with a lot of, um, uh, you know, baggage and all that. It's just us and we listen to them and, and hope we get some, some, you know, the right impression from that. The other way it's different from travelling, of course, for, for, for ordinary people is that so many people are familiar with your work, like His Holiness just now. Like yes. in Alaska, mm. Governor Sarah Palin, um, mm. working on a fishing boat and they recognised you from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And then in Hemingway, in the butcher shop, somebody sang a spam song. Um, <laughs> is it actually a help or a hindrance when you're making documentaries to be Michael Palin? Uh, well, generally speaking, it's a hindrance. Uh, I'd rather not be people who were... Uh, a classic thing was, was when we were doing an interview on the um, this... Uh, it's a coastal boat that goes up through the Norwegian, Norwegian fields. You probably know it. I think you call it the Hurtigrut or something. Yeah, and goes right up. On, on, yeah. Going right up the north of Norway. And we just did, as one does, Michael, go around the boat, just engage some people in conversation. So you go around. And we finally found this lighthouse keeper. And he was rather a character, actually. He was sort of looking gloomily out. He was the keeper of the highest, most normally lighthouse of all. And... Uh, you know, he, he, was, he was quite a character, and I uh, was talking to him, and, oh yes, you know, it's a, it's, it's a dark time up there, but I love being a lighthouse keeper. You should come and, and be in my lighthouse with me. And I, said, but I said, you know, but, but, but you know, what, what do you do, do during the six months of the year when it's pitch dark up there? And I said, oh, we watch your films on television. <laughs> we just couldn't, it looks so like a plug, and we can't do that. We just, uh, Say something else. So he then told me that Cliff Richard was his favourite singer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the, you know, things like that do happen. But no, I prefer to be um, the observer than observe myself. I think it's just you get much more out of that. So I like going to places where people, people have never heard of me. Okay, well, you're not afraid of references to your earlier work, as we shall see in the final clip. Shirt. <laughs> Sheffield City of Dripping. Um, it's become a kind of motif that whatever you're, wherever you are, you have to yeah. eat something absolutely disgusting. Um, do you sit there the night before thinking, what are they going to make me eat tomorrow? Well, you see, I, I take this with you here, you think it's disgusting, but it's just disgusting very, sometimes because it's unfamiliar. <coughs> it's like snakes in China, you know, I think, oh, eating snake, how disgusting, but they rear them specially there and cook them as a delicacy. So it's a bit like us eating lamb and all that. <coughs> but I do find myself eating, you know, being uh, offered certain things. I don't go out of the way to have something awful, but I go out of the way to have something local. Um, and it sometimes gets you in a few, a few problems. I mean, I, I, I'm glad I don't always ask. There was a, a place in um, uh, the Olabamba River when we go through Peru, and there was a, uh, a village there. And uh, there's an Indian uh, village, and the Mashagang are quite poor. But they, uh, the missionaries have been there, so they have a festival of St. John, something like that. And we went on shore, and these lovely old ladies came up with some gourd full of, um, of orangey yogurt sort of stuff. No, actually it wasn't orange, it was purple. And so they offered it to me, and you know, you can't just say, no, thank you. We've got the, um, we've got the new Buxton spring water. <laughs> um, just got it, it's, it's what they have. So, so I, I, I drank a bit of it, and it was to taste a bit acrid, but it was all right, it was fine. I said, what is this? I said, oh, it's palm wine, which they make special festivals, very, very strong. 
And this festival is so important that they've cut down half their sugar crop to strengthen and ferment this wine. Um, so I thought, oh, good. So I had another swig. <laughs> and then he said, and of course, in the, in the places where um, there is no sugar crop grown, um, it's fermented by the saliva from the old ladies of the village. And I suddenly realized these two ladies going. <laughs> I'd been drinking this with saliva, and I said, is there much, um, I just thought I'd check, much sugar growing around here? They said, no. <laughs> so in, in future, I think I probably would have, if someone had said, look, Michael, we want you to go and drink the saliva of the old ladies, I'd probably have said, um, I've got a better idea. <laughs> Let's have some Buxton spring water. Well, we saw that clip from New Europe, or should I say, Michael Palin's New Europe, as it was officially titled which, if I'm not mistaken, was the first time that yes. your name was... Yeah. was um, yeah. uh, what, what, what's going on there? Did you demand it? <laughs> no, I demanded... Uh, I, I fought a long-running battle to have my name below the title. And it worked very well, you know, Himalaya Sahara with Michael Palin. I don't want to call it Michael Palin's Himalaya, Michael Palin's sort of Pacific or whatever, but it did become a kind of fashion in the and it's, it's largely because of these, uh, you know, multi-channel um, menus. Uh, if it just says New Europe, people think, how boring, I'm not watching that. But if it says Michael Palin's New Europe, then that's fine. But uh, that's their view. I, I've always, I mean, my, my um, example in all this is the great David Attenborough, who is just the best documentary maker I know and has consistently done brilliant and, and informative programs. And he always has, you know, sort of. Uh, life in the undergrowth, life. It's not David Attenborough's life in the undergrowth, it's David Attenborough's life on earth. Good for him, you know. So I see him every now and then. We have a bit of battle. He says, I see you gave in over New Europe. I said, no, <laughs> they wouldn't deploy me if I didn't say Michael Payne was New Europe. But it was kind of interesting because there was a lot of resistance to <coughs> the idea of doing a program about Eastern Europe. Uh, no, not doing the program, but actually what you called it because. They felt that Eastern Europe was a real tale. If you said it's a program about Eastern Europe, no one would watch. And I felt rather hurt by that because, you know, I've, I've done six documentaries. They've all got big audiences, apart from Hemingway, got a slightly less audience, but they've generally got big audiences. They've been well covered. And I sort of to say, well, it's Eastern Europe, so bad luck. I, 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 there was a bit of bad blood there with the B. We had a bit of a few arguments over that. Um, so I don't think either of us was right. I think Eastern Europe is a difficult thing to sell, but I think you should sell it as for what it is, not try and pretend something else. You mentioned uh, multi-platform. You you are the original multi-platform man because oh, I was a train spotter. Yeah, eight started at five, then it's two. Um, because, because you've always um, had, had a book to, to accompany the series. Uh, first of all, is it? Um, something which is easy to combine, writing and filming, or are they actually in conflict? Uh, not in conflict, they just give you, it's a lot more hard work to keep the notebook out all the time, as well as being filmed and doing your bits and things. But I always do keep a, a notebook, whenever I travel, I think it's essential, as you know, you know, you go to wonderful places, you've just got to jot things down. So, you know, it's an extension of what I would normally do. Um, the, the book was just, when we did Around the World in 80 Days, BBC said they'd like a book of it. That, that was all. There was no great deal about it. And um, it sold very well, so then it became part of the deal from then on. Um, but yes, it does. There are some times when I just feel, God, I can't, you know, you know what, what am I doing? Am I a writer? Am I a presenter? I mean, what am I doing? So uh, uh, it, 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 can, it can be difficult sometimes, but it's very, very worthwhile. I'm very glad that I do do it. And uh, when I get back, when we get back from filming, uh, the film or the tape goes to the editor, and our editor looks through it, and he works with the director, and I leave them to it. And they work through all the material, and get it down to about an hour and five minutes, and then I see a rough cut, and then I say, well, I think we could do this or that. And meanwhile, I'm getting on with the book, in which I can write... Uh, without knowing what's going to be on the television programme, I just write the diary of the days. And a lot of it are things that happened when, I, when the camera wasn't actually running, or they're my own sort of little observations about people I've met, which I wouldn't be able to do because that sequence may not even be in the film. So it's, it's, it's not, they're not the same thing at all. And I think the book is a, is a sort of complementary to the, to the series always. So and I enjoy that. 
uh, worth pointing out that there's a new edition with a completely new chapter, which I learnt earlier, Michael finished writing yesterday. It is going to be in the shops, ladies and gentlemen, um, <laughs> on the 27th of November, which is remarkable. And if I'm not mistaken, that's exactly four weeks before Christmas. Um, <laughs> Other media are available, including audiobooks, I do believe. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but while all this is going on, your franchise, um, you've already lost the Palin franchise, the, 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 the franchise for beautifully observed, personality-driven travel documentaries has now been pinched by Jonathan Dimbleby in Russia, by Stephen Fry in America, by Paul Merton. What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> well... I don't know what is going on, really. Not plagiarism, that's not fair. But, uh, I mean, there are lots of people. I can remember, actually, when we did... Uh, we'd just done Pearl to Pearl, and I had a meal, and some people were there, and, and um, Stephen was there, Stephen Fry was there. And uh, he, he was... Uh, Hugh Laurie were both there, and they said, this is one that we'd love to do, something like you do. How do we do it? And I said, well, you'll just find a director, you'd be brilliant. It's just... It's different ways people see the world, and if you, you've got a way of looking at the world and you can articulate it, then terrific, everyone benefits. So they said, yes, yes, and, and then nothing happened. And, and the problem is, I think that I, I later talked to Stephen about it, he said, well, I was doing so many things and all that. And I said, well, you have got to actually give up the time. And you've got to give up about two years to do these things properly if you're going to do the book as well, and the editing and all the selling. So I think it's quite difficult for people who are... Who are uh, doing a lot of other things, as Stephen is, but, he, you know, I, I, I salute all these other programmes. I, I particularly like Jonathan's Dimbleby's uh, Russia. I thought that was really good, a nice uh, journey. Um, but it's not always the celebrities. I mean, you know, I think Bruce Parry, the, the Tribe series, very, very good indeed, doing something that no one else does at all, really getting to grips with it. Um, and so, you know, the more the merrier, really. Um, and Paul Merton, yeah, good for him. But someone said to him, you know, do you, are, you, are you the new Michael Palin? He said, well, you ask Michael if he's the old Paul Merton. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was, that was good. Uh, I suppose I started something, and, and uh, you, you know, I, I once had, had an idea that, that, that all the Pythons should do a travel documentary, because everyone's got their own way of doing these things. John actually... John Cleese did a very good documentary about lemurs in Madagascar. I don't know if anyone saw it. Um, it was excellent, really good, especially as it got very, very ratty. I love to see that. I think I got ratty. John was really ratty. Ruddy in the forest. It was in the tropical rainforest, one of the most uncomfortable parts of the world. He said, Mickey, do you get? Do you get irritated? I said, yeah, but I've never been to a tropical rainforest for that amount of time. You, you know, you're starting the hardware, and uh, he agreed. It was pretty <laughs> awful, but I love seeing people get ratty on the screen. <laughs> um, very good moment just to take a few very quick <coughs> questions. Uh, if we can have the house lights up. If anybody has a question for Michael, which I have um, inadvertently failed to ask. A uh, gentleman there. Um, with the locations you go to, do you ever get there and find that there's, they've just been flooded by film crews and documentary filmmakers, and they kind of... Uh, they already know what they're doing. Kind of feed your performance. Um, yeah, I did them asking whether we go to places and we find that being film crews have been through the place and virtually looted it of all the experiences. Um, well, I mean, there are certain places you go to, I suppose, where you're, you're aware that you've seen this on film sometime, somehow. I mean, maybe some of the... Uh, you go to the Taj Mahal or something like that, or, or even, you know... Uh, Mumbai or somewhere, and you've seen those street scenes before, but I've never, I've never felt this. Uh, you've just got to look for an angle. I mean, when we went down the Nile, I mean, Nile cruises must have been done endlessly, and they're fairly static things. But um, um, I feel that what, what we got there was, was sort of fresh, and uh, it's not so much the place, it's the people who are there that... Uh, and they will change all the time. The people there, the people you're talking to, I think that's what makes it different each time. But you're right. I mean, I do like to get to places where uh, the camera crews haven't been as much, but uh, you can't go through Peru and not get to Machu Picchu, so you've got to do it in some shape or form. But uh, uh, I think it's generally the people rather than the places that make um, a sequence. Thank you. Um, next question, please. And if you could wait for one of the people in the EasyJet outfits, uh, gentlemen there. <laughs> <laughs> 
say was your most outstanding experience of all your experiences of these things? What's the thing that stands out most to you of all your years of filming? Oh, well, uh, there's, a number of, there's a number of highlights. I suppose, you know, getting to the South Pole was pretty extraordinary. Um, standing at the, uh, actually on the pole one night. I was growing up in Sheffield. These were the sort of, my heroes were Scott Lambs and all that. And then it was pretty extraordinary. We, we got there, and it had been quite difficult getting there, and a little very light plane. And the pilot had never been to the South Pole before. He just tells us that we're on our way. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a moment of history, and I tried to register that, and it's quite an interesting sort of thing, what, what can go wrong. Because I did a, I was going to do a piece to camera, this was the end of the series uh, of Pole to Pole, and I prepared a piece, um, about, you know, sort of like 90 seconds long, describing what I felt about being there and having done this great journey. And uh, so we get out there, and it's minus 50 with wind chill, and Nigel's worried whether the camera's going to, going to be able to deal with it, so we've got to get it done first time. And so we get out there, and first of all, everyone there wears sort of triple balaclavas. And the director says, we've got to take the balaclava off, otherwise no one will know who you are. <laughs> That's pretty rare. We've just done 10 hours of ten. We've never come to the North Pole. <laughs> oh, it's Terry Wogan. <laughs> what a surprise. Anyhow. Um, so I did this piece, and I did. A, uh, I tried to encapsulate what I was trying to say about my heroes being there. And we got to the end, and I got it absolutely word perfect, 90 seconds. Very, very pleased with myself. So right, let's go indoors. And I see the sound man sort of kind of giggling a bit. Mm -hmm. I said, "What? Are you it's awful out here. It's the grimmest place we've ever done any work. What are you smiling at? You, know, you perhaps ought to listen to it. You might want to do it again." So I listened to it, and he was right because I'd said at one point. I remember. Um, as a schoolboy in Sheffield, reading about the exploits of Scott and Amundsen under the bedclothes at night. <laughs> <laughs> and there it was, you know, suddenly a, a new take on exploration. <laughs> uh, sorry, darling, no, you can't come. I'm going to some chats. It's a men's thing. It's a men's thing. <laughs> Um, so I had to do it then about, and of course the next one I got it completely wrong and tried to say that, uh, you know, it, it's, um, I wanted to make the point about the South Pole being 10,000 feet up, which it is, and not many people know that, I think it's all flat. And of course I said, I'm in here, standing here at 10,000 degrees, and uh, <laughs> so I do it again. So it's a collapse of staff party, did about six takes. But it was one of the great moments, getting there and, and, and standing there. And, uh, a pity it just ended in such farce. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, there's a rumour going around uh, DocFest, which I've picked up on, that the BBC is actually going to remake that, a journey from the Arctic, with an investment banker who doesn't quite get there because of the difficult times. It's going to be called Pole to Dole. <laughs> <laughs> Time for one more question. Um, uh, we, uh, any... Uh, oh, right. My goodness me, gentlemen up there, very eager. Uh, if you can wait for one of the people in the Dalai Lama outfit. <laughs> Hi Michael, um, I just wanted to ask you which place or location have you been to where you felt the biggest culture shock? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, well, the place I felt most strange in was um, uh, Magadan up in um, Siberia. And, and it wasn't that I sort of didn't recognise the people, but the, the you know, this, this place had been created by slave labour um, in the 1930s. The whole city had been built by uh, uh, enemies of the state that Stalin was sent out there to the Gulag camps. And the road that had been built into the interior was apparently just built on bones of people who died there and all that. And it was just quite um, uh, impossible to try and relate this to anywhere else I'd seen in the world, because we went from Magadan north into uh, to one of the camps that's still there, right up in the Kalima region called Butubija, and so you could see the buildings there, and it was just, I just couldn't relate it to anything I knew, I, it was, uh, there was a real sense of, of evil to the place, and so although, I mean, it's not culture shock, it's just something that uh, normally I can feel an empathy with somewhere and some, the people are there or whatever, but this place just left me completely cold and it was a very really disconcerting feeling. Um, 
Uh, and I mean culture shock, well you do, do find that, I suppose, going to um, the Amazon and, and the, the Indians and, and palm wine and all that, that's a, that's a bit of a shock. And yet, as soon as you've got people there who smile, it's absolutely fine. Um, uh, but, uh, but funnily enough, the most difficult places to film are, are places like Beverly Hills, uh, where we went through doing a full circle, because they're very guarded there. I mean, everywhere you go, these little villages, which is a very different way of life from our own, um, and yet the people there share things and, and, and give you food and hospitality and all that. So the basic universal human instincts come out. You go to somewhere like Beverly Hills or anywhere that's very, very rich, and there's nobody about, you know, all the doors are locked. Uh, you have to ring agents in order to get an interview and all that sort of stuff. And you realize this is a world um, which, is, which is, in a sense, um, very, very different from the world I, I like and the world I know. So I would say Beverly Hills is probably um, culture shock for me. <laughs> <laughs> a world away from Sheffield. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking officially the nicest man in television, the nicest man in travel, <laughs> Sheffield's yeah. finest, Michael Palin. start late, it's not any fault of my own, but we start about half an hour late. I know Simon's got to go because he's got to run the, um, to go to the travel awards in London, big travel awards tonight. So he's got to zoom back on the 6.18. I'm going to <laughs> find a later train. So if anyone wants to just uh, ask me some questions for the next sort of 10 minutes or so, um, is that okay? Yes, we'll this is a bit like, um, oh, it's very, very odd, the interviewer actually leaving before the... <laughs> Quite right. It's a bit of a Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, we'll just another few minutes because I was conscious that we were down for an hour and a half. So, any questions? Yeah, I've got here. It's a time. Where? Okay. So. Michael, you, you, you've obviously had a cup of tea in a lot of different places. Um, what's the most interesting place and the most interesting type of tea? <laughs> oh, well, uh, yak butter tea has to be the one. I never really got used to it, but it's all they drink in, in Tibet. It, it's, uh, there's no sugar, so they have butter in their tea, a bit like in India we have also butter in the tea. And we went there, and, and um, at the first bit of yak butter tea we were given, um, our cameraman Nigel said, it's like, it's like drinking liquid gorgonzola. <laughs> <laughs> I felt better about it after that. And, and so long as you sort of stop thinking about it as tea, as we know, and think of it more as an exotic soup, then you're fine. It's just thinking, this is tea, it's not tea, as we know. Um, but uh, a good question. Uh, funnily enough, the one thing when I come back, people say, what do you do as soon as you come back home? And I always have, make myself a cup of tea. I mean, it's corny, but I really do. I love that cup of tea. In, in, that, in that case, then, would you be happy to come around to our house for a cup of tea? <laughs> <laughs> where, where do you live? Hillsborough. Hillsborough. Oh, I'm a, 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 a blades fan. Yes. You're all over the place in real and wonderful places with only a small crew. Have you had any real technical difficulties and what have you done with them? Have you, you know, has the camera been dropped? Or, you know, yes. Um, well, we've never really had to, we hardly ever, um, touch wood, in case I do some more, the seventh series really had um, problems with the camera that couldn't have been solved by a little bit of sort of uh, local trickery and um, they've got you know the spare parts and all that. But the film camera no problems at all. Uh, when we got the HD camera on uh, New Europe uh, in the second week 
It just failed to function. And it had to, we had to send it home, and we had to lose a day while they got a new camera out to us. And there, was some, there was some problem in it, which they've, then, they've now discovered. Um, so that was the only time in all the filming we actually lost a day without the camera. Uh, and it's been dropped in water and all sorts of things. Um, although, I mean, uh, there was a wonderful moment, I remember, when we were filming, uh, it was a Hemingway, I think, and we um, were filming in a, a canoe. I was in a canoe, and Nigel and uh, John Pritchard were all in their canoe. And um, for some reason, it wasn't particularly deep, <laughs> but their canoe tipped over. I suddenly saw them going out, going out, suddenly went. And Nigel fell in the water and put the camera up. There. <laughs> Brilliant, actually. He got completely sodden. The camera was held up like Excalibur. <laughs> um, so they, they, they do look after it well. But, uh, you know, oddly enough, we've hardly ever had to stop filming for more than a couple of hours. Um, and that goes for sound recording as well. We've been very, very lucky. Yeah. Yes, some people up there. There's a lady up there, right, in the, you're right on the end. Yeah, waving there. You're not from Hillsborough, are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I agree. I'd say yes, there are certain places I'd like very much indeed. Um, but I couldn't actually live there because I wouldn't have my friends around me and I wouldn't have my family there. And I'm very much, you know, I, I, we've lived in the same house for 40 years and all that sort of thing. I'm quite, although I travel a lot when I come home, I'm very aware of the, the, the place I'm in. But yeah, they're, they're, they're varied. I, I, I always rather liked. Um, there was a sequence we did in Colombia, and uh, Colombia was pretty rough parts of it. We'd seen some sort of drug trafficking in Bogota and all that, and I was thinking this is a pretty grim place, an emerald mine where people were sort of clawing at the earth to get emeralds out and all that. And then we were taken up to the plateau, which is the most beautiful climate up there, it's a coffee growing area. And this man took us to his house, and it was just after the frenetic scenes we'd seen for the last sort of three or four days. It was an absolute wonderful piece. And it was, it was very, you know, um, fertile. Everything grew there, lovely gardens. The house was nice. It was like, a bit like a, a hill station with a sort of Latin flavor to it. So I, I can remember thinking, oh, I, could, I could enjoy this. And, uh, um, and also there's a, there's a city called Cartagena, which is in, in also in Colombia, which is I felt it wasn't far away to go down there to the sea, and that's a very exotic city and a wonderful place. So for a while, I got the sort of Latin American bug and thought, yes, this is this is for me, you know. <laughs> I'm a Sheffield man, Latin America, Sheffield. We all have passion. <laughs> uh, you know, we all have passion. <laughs> if we don't have passion, I'll tell them all. <laughs> but so uh, yeah, that was, that was some place. But generally speaking, I've always wanted to. I'd be quite happy to move on, but you'll get. Uh, there's another place in southern, what is it, South America, southern Chile, um, Chile and Patagonia. Um, not particularly want to live there, but it's a spectacular place to go and spend some time. And I was very, very sad that we moved so quickly through this area because it's wonderful peaks, wonderful glaciers, uh, lovely lakes, nice little hotels. Um, you know, just small scale things, wonderful walks and all that. And, and you know, just occasionally, if you were going too fast, please can we can we stay here for a week or another couple of weeks? Um, and then there are cities that I like. I mean, Sydney. I wouldn't mind living in, in Sydney. But as I say, in the end, I'm glad to get home. Right. Anybody else? Uh, Lady <coughs> here. Yes. Me. Yes, you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, unlike myself, Michael, do you resist the temptation to bring back souvenirs for everybody? <laughs> um, I, I, well, I sort of do, yeah, because, again, you're travelling so fast that actually picking up souvenirs, you've got to put them somewhere, and you, I mean, I do like to travel as light as possible. I like to know, know that everything in my, my bags it has a purpose and a reason for being there. So I tend to, tend to buy things rather late on. Usually at uh, Gatwick Airport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they're not really good on national cities. But smaller things, I mean, you know, like little bits of fabric and scarf and things. And, and, and my wife likes sort of, uh, she does like kind of bangles and, and, uh, and, and little sort of necklaces and things like that. So I will bring, I'll bring things like that back. But I've, I've, it's been impossible to bring everything back for everybody. 
um, that you want to sort of look after. So I, I, it's easier probably to say no. But you, you bring a lot of things back, do you? You do, yeah. You're like David Attenborough. <laughs> <laughs> well, David's looped the world. I didn't realize this. I didn't realize this house. He said, oh, that came from there. And I thought, that, yeah, so I found a chap who said, yes, that's very nice. So can I have it? He said, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so the world is at David's house. <laughs> I've just got a few strange odd fossils. And you bring back fossils, and I quite like bringing back rock from places where I've, I've you know, been in some wonderful location. Then I forget where they come from. So I'm now rather alien attentive and I label my rocks. <laughs> Sahara, sort of, you know, um, Algeria, Libya, border. But just a rock with a label on it, doesn't it? Quite <laughs> right. A couple more? Yeah, gentlemen up there. What's the most boring place you've been to? <laughs> Beverly Hills. <laughs> There was a place called uh, Pucalpa, which is also in the, in, just to say that the Amazon is not all glamorous. And I just didn't know, I mean, uh, uh, rarely get to a place where there's absolutely nothing to do at all. But there was nothing to do there at all. The hotel was awful, the food was awful, the beer was awful, the town was awful. Um, it uh, just got quite depressed, really. And I usually on these journeys, you can kind of read a book and you kind of, you create your own interest, but this place had a sort of a negative boredom energy, or a positive boredom uh, energy, which I guess was, was uh, you, you know, made me feel very, very glad to get out of that. Where was that so I could avoid it? Um, well, you go up uh, San Diego Freeway and you just come up <laughs> just under the Hollywood side. Um, no, it's, it's, in, uh, it's in South America, it's in, in uh, Peru, I think. Anyone know for Calpa? Yeah. Oh, the mayor is here, do you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so, what do you think about it? I, I, I thought it was a bit of a shithole myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but I had the Magic Ganga all right. I yes. Guess, um, the Magic Ganga are great, yeah. Not do you all ever see the Magic Ganga? These are the Indians I was talking about with the palm wine. But we also on this festival day, that we, uh, they have big football matches. And the team are all women. And these women, completely barefoot, playing football, cracking the ball in from 30 yards. And the men are all under the tree, absolutely pissed. There <laughs> <laughs> so all over the world, I <laughs> I was really impressed, these ladies. <laughs> Bare feet, the ball slightly flat. But, oh God, they were whacking them in. And these guys were all... Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> it was an that work. Did you? Oh. Drinks, but yes, yes, fiery stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, chicha. Yeah, beer. Spit in with their... oh. Sorry, we just. <laughs> <laughs> the mayor of Pocalpa, very good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, talking of the English place, sure, do you want to get that? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Well, that was a very good start, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, to carry on the theme of being pissed, when you're off the the uh, local vintage, so to speak. Yeah. Disciplined, are you? Do you ever relax and go home bored or what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, quite a good. <laughs> well, I'm usually, I, I lack discipline as far as alcohol is concerned. Because if, if people are very happy and they're all having a, a drink uh, uh, and, and it's a great way of loosening tongues and getting to know people, I tend to go along with it. But on the, uh, you see, in, in Himalaya, for instance, not a problem. Pakistan, a big dry country. Um, Tibet, not an awful lot of beers and drinks to be had, so that was absolutely fine. New Europe, I knew that I was going to have problems because <laughs> everywhere in Eastern Europe, they ply you with drinks as soon as you get there, and they're all making their own brandies or their own distillation, which you know, during the communist years they've, you know, they, 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 they've developed to give them their own particular sort of private staff. And, um, and I was right there, there was an awful lot around. And if you're doing it in the middle of the day and you've got to work in the afternoon, I limited myself to three or four. Um, <laughs> and things like that, Palinka, I don't know if you've had Palinka, very, very strong, and they all, they all think it's wonderful. They're going to give you, hey, Palinka, Pani, Palinka, you're drinking. <laughs> yeah. And so they would buy, and there was one, 
particular sequence we did where everyone else was completely pissed. I was on, I got on about three or four, they'd had about 12, they'd been drinking all day, and they were playing music in the house and all that. And there was a man next to me hitting a drum at the table, and his face was bright pews, and everyone was staring like that. And I realized, I'm going mad, this is under the volga uh, volcano time. So I, I then reined in my, my, uh, my drink. But it's very, very difficult not to, as you know, to uh, reject hospitality. So we used to have to say, the way of getting out of it was saying, oh, the crew have got to get back to the hotel and check their equipment. And uh, write, you know, they write up the day's rushes and all that sort of thing. Um, whereas, of course, the crew drank far more than I ever did. <laughs> portrayed them as these sort of uh, um, fundamentalist, sort of uh, uh, dry, uh, God-fearing folk. Uh, but it got me out of some real spots. Yeah. One more? One last one? Oh, all right. One of that. Let me up there. You've obviously been to so many places. What is the most spiritual place that you've been to? Not Beverly Hills, no. Um, <laughs> spiritual place. Um, that's a very good question. I wish I had a, a sort of quick answer for that. Um, I suppose, in a sense, uh, um, Tibet, which is what you expect one to say really, but it does, it does have a quite extraordinary um, uh, feeling to it, which I suppose is akin to a spiritual feeling, because it's pretty bleak up there. Um, and it's, it's, it's dry and cold and, <coughs> and, and uncomfortable. And for the first two or three days there, I thought, this is just the grimmest place I've ever been to. It's just so difficult. I mean, you could see there were beauties around and the architecture and all that sort of thing, but really, really difficult place to be in. And then I found when I, I got, got to, to, to sort of got used to the place and what it was like, that it had a very powerful feel to it. And that, that way of life of the people there, I think because it was such a hard life, I became fascinated by how they lived, how they moved, how they survived, how they looked, you know, and the, the, they just generally moved quite slowly because that, that's, uh, you, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a difficult place to get around. You don't rush, there's not lots to do. And that's, that's a very calming effect. And of course, there, there's all the Buddhist monasteries, so everybody's mm -hmm. at it, you know, the monasteries praying and, and, and chanting and all that sort of stuff. And, I, although it was, I think, the most uncomfortable place I've ever worked in, and it's, it's most unforgettable. It's a place I still think about a lot. And I suppose that means it must have had some, some quite strong spiritual effect. And, and, you know, what's happening to it is sad, really. You just see it becoming uh, a clone of the rest of China, and the big tall buildings are going up, all that, and the number of people in the monasteries are being reduced. And, you know, for me, the Patala Palace and all that has a real significance, but the rest of it, the rest of Lhasa was very, very disappointing, and it didn't, didn't have the same feelings there that I got in the, in the rest of the country. So, sad. Anyway, um, I suppose I'll let it go. <laughs> Thank you very much.